Keith Kaiser here once again with a study in God's Word. We're doing studies in the Gospel according to Matthew. And today we come again to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, it's interesting that he was positing that the Lord Jesus could have all of this power and glory if he'd just fall down and worship, if he would prostrate himself before Satan and offer him the allegiance and the adoration that is due only to God. And of course, the Lord Jesus refused to do this. You know, Satan will give people different gifts and different things, but there's always a price tag. And he's a poor paymaster. He's really a slaver. He enslaves people. And we're already enslaved to our sin. And Satan doesn't want to deliver us from sin. He pulls those chains tighter around us. But the Lord Jesus, he's the chain breaker. He's the liberator. He's the great redeemer who buys people out of the slavery of sin. And he wasn't going to fall down and worship Satan. He responds in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now again, the Lord Jesus goes to the scriptures as his defense. That is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth, as Ephesians 6 says. And our Lord wields that sword as a master swordsman. You know, like any fencing expert or black belt in the Japanese art of kendo, the Lord knew how to handle the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And he brings it here in the proper fashion. He knows the scripture to use. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Interestingly, in all three of these temptations, he has gone back to Deuteronomy. Suffice it to say, that's not on everybody's hit list. That's not the most popular book that people go to and read, even for their devotions. Even Christians uh, don't really like Deuteronomy so much. There's a lot of rules and regulations and things that seem arcane and ancient and distant from our lives today. But every scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, and it's profitable. So we can't neglect any part of it. And the Lord Jesus' attention to Deuteronomy here shows us that this is the very thing that gives him the victory, his knowledge of Scripture and his right application of it. And we need to search the Scriptures. Really, it is the Christian spiritual food. Uh, we're born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he reveals himself through the Scriptures. So it's by believing his word that the gospel, the good news of salvation, first came to us. And once we're Christians, once we have eternal life, we need that ongoing food of the word. This is how God speaks to us. This is how God guides us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs says. And it's in this scripture, in this holy book, that God tells us the principles that we need to live by. He tells us, of course, what he is like. And the Holy Spirit, whom he gives to believers, is writing on our hearts and minds his law. That is, his word becomes the new operating system that drives our thinking and our living. We speak differently. We act differently. We do what we do because the Lord is changing us and altering us to come into conformity to his word and into conformity, therefore, with his will. And we become more like the Lord the better we know this book, the more we listen to the Lord in the scripture and say, Lord, make me like that. Lord, empower me to live that way. Lord, help me to obey that by the power of your spirit, because as a human being, I don't have the capacity to do that. I can't remake myself, and yet you've made me a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm a new creation, part of a new creation, thanks to the grace of God, thanks to the powerful working of his word. And this salvation is working effectually. It is effective, that is, in accomplishing God's purposes. Like Isaiah the prophet had said, the word of God won't return again void. It will accomplish that for which it's sent. The Lord Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. And over and over we read in these gospels, 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus' birth was in conformity with the scriptures. His life and ministry was in conformity with the scriptures. His death on the cross was in conformity with the scriptures, as was his resurrection three days later and the ascension, all foretold in the scriptures, all predicted and prophesied centuries before. And so this is the holy book we feed on. Christ is our spiritual food, and we feed on him as we read his word and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, as young Samuel the prophet was taught to say in the Old Testament. We prayerfully approach this book, and we talk to God in prayer, and we say, Lord, show me wonderful things out of your law. Lord, don't just make me a spiritual egghead, you know, filling my mind with data. You can learn a lot about ancient history. You can study archaeology. You can learn ancient languages, and you can learn all sorts of things about the culture of the land of the Bible. These are all useful tools in interpreting Scripture and understanding what it says. So we don't denigrate them. We don't say those things are unimportant. But the heart of the matter is hearing the voice of God in Scripture, hearing God speak to us and saying, this is the precious holy Bible that God's given us, his word. And as the Lord Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, 17, he said, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. So the Lord always went back to the Scripture. That was his guide for faith and practice. That was how he lived. He lived in conformity with the scriptures. He walked according to the law of God and feared the Lord. And as he says later in Matthew chapter 5, he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So the scriptures that we read, the law being a term for the Bible, for the scriptures of the Old Testament, all those stories, the histories, and then the symbolic things like the tabernacle and the sacrifices, they're all pointing toward Christ. Of course, the prophecies, directly talking about Messiah who would come and be the Savior of the world. And so the Lord Jesus was the ultimate man of the book, the one who had the word of God, not only in his mouth, because the Pharisees had that as well. The, the, he says, your word is near unto you. It's even in your mouth, but it's not in your heart. Well, the Lord Jesus was different. The Lord Jesus had what God the Father wanted, truth in the inward parts. The Lord Jesus, the blessed Son of God from all eternity who would please the Father, now on earth as a man, lived in obedience and dependence upon his Father, lived in conformity with the leading of the Holy Spirit, lived in conformity with what God's Word said. And so the thought of bowing down and worshiping Satan, the thought of idolatry, putting anything in the place of the true and living God, because that's what idolatry is. It's not just bowing down to a statue or an image or an icon. Those things can be forms of idolatry. But anything that we put in God's place and live for that and give the loyalty and allegiance and love that only God deserves, well, that, of course, is an idol. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to be idolaters. First John ends in the last verse of the book, the end of chapter 5, it says, little children flee from idolatry. So even Christians have to be aware of falling prey to idols and of worshiping things and setting our eyes upon things that are wrong and that divert our minds uh, from God and dilute our loyalty toward our Creator. But the Lord Jesus would never do that. He'd say, away with you, Satan. You're an adversary. That's what Satan means. He says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So the Lord Jesus does what Israel singularly failed to do in their history. Over and over again in their history, they would go after other gods. They would get their eyes off the true and living God. They would forget what God would do for them. And the Lord had to chasten them and had to discipline them spiritually and had to send prophets one after the other till finally they had to be taken away into captivity into Babylon for 70 years. And when they were eventually brought back, they didn't worship images. They didn't worship Baal or Chemosh or Ashtaroth or any of these ancient deities. They worshiped the true and living God. But the unfortunate thing is 
that while you can physically have removed all the idols, you can have taken all things away that are outward signs of disloyalty to the Lord, what the New Testament shows us is, even in the name of the true God, you can live a life of idolatry, a life of hypocrisy, where you're pretending to be something that you're not. You're putting on an act. You claim to worship the true and living God, but when push comes to shove, uh, you're not really bowing to his word. You're not really a worshiper of God. You might worship money. You might worship prestige and reputation. You might worship your business. You might worship your family. You might worship your job or your house or your car or your school or whatever it is. We can put any number of things in the place that God alone deserves. And we have to realize, no, it's a very subtle trap. You know, you can be very orthodox appearing and you can use the right terminology. You can say, I'm a Christian or I'm a believer or I'm a Christ follower, or, I'm a disciple, whatever term you use. And yet you can say that and never have actually bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, my Lord and my God, save me a sinner. And even once we are saved, as I say, we can get distracted and get our eyes off the Lord. Well, remember, when Peter came out walking on the water, he was okay as long as he looked to the Lord. But when he got his eyes off of Christ, that is when he began to sink. And it's the same with us. Let us take our gaze, spiritually speaking, off of the Lord Jesus, and we begin to sink as well. You see, we have to have, as Ephesians 1 says, Paul in his prayer there said, that he was praying that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they'd understand the glorious inheritance that they had been given in Christ. So that's what we want to do, to look to God's word and say, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let me see what life is all about, that it's all about the Lord Jesus. It's all about knowing him, that I may know him, and the power and the fellowship of his sufferings and the, sorry that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death as Philippians 3:10 says and that's what life is all about it's Christ uh, Paul says it earlier in that same book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 for me to live is Christ and to die is gain I once heard a dear missionary brother paraphrase it this way he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is more of the same. You have Christ on earth here, and he's the one you're putting your gaze on. You're worshiping him. You love the Lord Jesus, and you're growing in him and walking with him, and you die. What happens? Do you lose Christ? No, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You go from having the Lord indwelling you by his Holy Spirit here on earth, to being in the presence of the Lord spiritually. And then, of course, when the Lord comes back, you're one of those dead in Christ that 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks about. He raises you. And as Philippians 3 describes it, your vile body or the body of your humiliation becomes a glorious body. Your corruptible puts on incorruption, as 1 Corinthians 15 says. Your mortal puts on immortality. Because he has risen, so you will rise too. The Lord Jesus raises your body and joins it with soul and spirit to be a glorified human being, just like he is a man in the glory, a glorified human being, the paradigm of what we shall be for all eternity. He is the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of the resurrection, in other words, the one who's bringing many sons to glory and who's going to populate heaven with people that look and act like him. People, therefore, that are accepted in the beloved one, as Ephesians 1 says. People that are united to him by faith. Christ, who is our life, as Colossians 3 puts it. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then will we appear with him also in glory. What a wonderful privilege it is to worship God. And what a blasphemous, abominable notion it is to fall down and worship Satan. There are people that call themselves Satanists today. And of course, it's a foolish thing to think that Satan can do anything for them. As we said before, to follow his way is to go straight to spiritual eternal destruction, to go to the lake of fire and exist there for all time separated from God. What an awful thing. But so many people that don't 
openly avow Satan. They don't describe themselves as Satanists. They might call themselves Christian. They might call themselves Hindu or Buddhist or agnostic or something else. Uh, either way, if they're trusting in anything else than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says they're lost. That he who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son has not life, as 1 John 5 tells us. So come to the Lord Jesus and be saved. And if you know the Lord Jesus, walk with him, worship him, make him your focus, because you don't want to fall prey to deception. You don't want to get your eyes on other things and be led astray. And so the Lord triumphed and said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. And we read the aftermath in verse 11. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So grueling was this experience physically, emotionally and spiritually. He needed angelic ministration. He needed those angels to come and be the celestial EMTs or paramedics to uh, were to minister to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him in that way. So spiritual battles are difficult and they can wear us out, but there are resources in God for renewing our strength and strengthening us. But we have to look to him and seek him in his word to be strengthened by it. So may God help you as you fight the good fight of faith and walk with the Lord Jesus, because the end's not in doubt. He's already made us more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us, Romans 8 says. The battle's won. We're just waiting for these final mopping up operations to be ended and all of God's purposes and promises to be fulfilled regarding this world and, of course, the one to come. I hope that you know the Lord Jesus, and if you don't, friend, today is the day to get right with the Lord. Thank you for listening.